Well, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The first commandment that is spoken is in Exodus chapter 20. In verse 3, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second commandment states, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. With the topic that we have selected, the person who played God, you might be thinking, well, I know who that person is. It's one person that comes to mind, and I think I know exactly who that person is that we're going to be studying about, studying about today. Before thinking about that person, I want to direct you back to Uzzah and in his experience. In the book of Samuel, we read about Uzzah, who was seeking to help in a situation that was quickly going out of control. The Ark of the Lord had been captured by the Philistines. And it stayed there for a number of days until they decided that they didn't want the ark to be there any longer. They had initially set it in their house of one of their gods, Dagon, and the statue of Dagon had been pushed over. And the next morning, the people came and they saw it falling down and they put it back up. And then they came back again the, the following day, and they saw the same thing that had been done, except this time it had been altered. The, the head and the, the arms had been chopped off of the statue. And they were very superstitious a lot, and they understood that, hey, this could not have just happened. You know, falling over one time is one thing. But coming back and finding that it is decapitated and that the uh, arms have been removed, been amputated, then this is not just happenstance. This was not a breeze that blew it over. That this must be somehow the God of Israel showing his displeasure. Now, when they had captured the Ark of God and they had placed it there, this was in consequence of the victory that they had received over the Israelites. This was during the time period of, of Eli. Uh, Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they had done some things that it brought the displeasure of God in terms of the priesthood, but the people were walking contrary to the express into the known will of God. And the Israelites were beaten, and the Philistines were triumphing over it. They felt that their gods had been more superior than the God of Israel. And so they took these, uh, this statue, or rather, uh, the, of Dagon, and continued to to erect it. And they had plagues that came upon the, the Philistines. And so the Philistines said, well, it must, they consulted again their leaders and they figured that this must be again the hand of the, of the invisible one. And they, they decided that they would make a peace offering and send it back uh, to way of Israel if it was in fact Israel's God that had been responsible. And so they said, we'll take an, an ox that has just given birth. And we will set up uh, the ark behind it, and we're going to send as a peace offering little trinkets of jewels that have been made in the form of the hemorrhoids. We'll send those back, and if the oxen go and not look back, and they go to the way heading toward Israel, we'll know that this was indeed Israel's God doing this. And as you recall the story, the oxen set out and they marched 
towards the land of Israel. And when the Philistines saw it, of course, this confirmed their thoughts. The Israelites, on the other hand, when they saw the ark coming back, they were ecstatic. They were triumphant because they didn't know how they would get the ark back. It had been captured to them. It was more of a, of a good luck charm. And that was why they brought it into battle when they went with Hophni and Phinehas. They felt that this was the symbol of God's presence, and it was a, a good luck omen to have. Like some people go out, and they want to have their good luck uh, rabbit's foot. Like they, they, they won't leave out without their, their uh, amulet on. Or if they go out, they'll go back in real quick because they, if I don't have it, it's going to be bad trouble. I need to have this good luck charm. This is how Israel had treated God. They saw him as a good luck charm, not recognizing that he had promised blessing and success in war, but all of that was contingent upon the partnership that they would have with him. So as the Israelites see the ark that had been captured coming back, they shout, they are ecstatic that the ark is coming back. And the Israelites quickly clamor and begin to try to look inside the, the ark to see what is there, and God slays countless ones because of their disobedience. After some time of the ark being there for uh, some years, a number of years, scores pass by. David determines that he wants to bring the ark and to bring it up to Jerusalem. And they send these men to lead who were Levites to bring the ark back. And in the process of bringing it back, the ark begins to shift as though it's about to fall off. And Uzzah sees what is happening there. And he doesn't want the ark to fall to the ground. So he reaches forth to grab hold of it, to, to steady it up so that it will not fall. And in doing so, he is smitten down. So imagine all of that, if, if you were to have seen that happen so quickly and so fast, that the oxen are pulling the ox, the oxen stumble, it looks like the, the ark is falling off, someone goes to grab it, they're struck dead, the ark doesn't fall off because you don't read that it falls off, it doesn't fall off, it is sustained, it is kept. And Uzzah is dead, and when David finds out, David is, is upset. He is upset that Uzzah has been killed. We know that Uzzah was killed because he was an, an impure man. You read in, in the story. He died, quote, trying to protect the things that were God's. But the one that we think of more so than anyone else is Lucifer. I read of the, him in the book of Isaiah, that he said in his heart that I will be like God, that I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, that, yea, I will be like the Most High. That his attempt was to be as God. And Ezekiel says that you will be brought down to the pits of hell. You who made the nations tremble. You're going to be stripped down from all that you have, and men shall look and wag their tongues at you and say, are you the man that caused all the nations of the earth to tremble. Isaiah 14 talks about, again, how he would position himself. And so we think of him as being the, the person who, uh, above all others, was trying to play God. And we see that ultimately God is saying that, that you're not God, I am, and that you will one day be brought low. But that is not the, the person that I want to... Uh, take our attention to this morning. Rather, I'd like to, to draw your attention first to the book of Psalms 96 and to see some characteristics about God. First in Psalms 96, verse 4 and 5, we'll see three characteristics that I chose to emphasize about the character and the very nature of God. Really, how, how does he set himself apart from every other deity that, that is there? There are thousands of gods that exist in the world. So how is he setting himself apart from everyone else? What is his mark of distinction between him and the competitors that are there? In Psalms 96, verse 4 and 5, it says, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised, 
he, meaning Yahweh or Jehovah, is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are what? They're idols. They're idols. They are made with men's hands. But the distinction is the Lord made the heavens. So how does God distinguish himself from all the other idols that are there? He says that, that these are idols. These are made with men's hands, but I am the one, I made the heaven. So he is the creator. In Psalms 115, verse 15. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatever he pleaseth. The idols that they have are of silver. These are the works of men's hands. So our God is in the heavens. He is the one that has created. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 5. Thus saith the Lord God, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it. He is the one that giveth breath unto the people, and the spirit to walk therein. So again, you see that the idea. God is the one that made the heavens. God is the one that made the earth. He is the one that has made man and given man the, his breath or his spirit. Additionally, in Isaiah 42, verse 4, rather, verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formeth thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, and that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. He is saying, I am the Creator. I am also your Redeemer. So we see an aspect of God as him being the creator, but we also see an additional aspect of him being the redeemer. Uh, further, we read in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 11. Thus shall ye say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even those will perish from off the earth. What gods? The ones that have not made the heavens and the earth. The ones that have been made by your imagination. The ones that have been formed by your hands. These shall perish from the earth. We also see an additional characteristic in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. And the core of the heart of the three angels' messages as it begins. Well, we read... And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of earth. Once again in Revelation, God is setting himself up as the one who has created and who has made everything. So one of the important characteristics that distinguishes or that sets our God apart is that he is the creator. He creates the heavens, the earth, the sea, all of us. The other aspect that we see that sets him apart is that he is the Redeemer. He takes that title upon himself. I am the one that formed you. I am the one that redeemed you. I am the one that wakes you up. I am the one that watches over you. I am the one that gives you life. I am the one who has saved you. He shows himself as being the Redeemer. Further in uh, Psalms 78 and verse 35, in the following verses you'll see again that he emphasizes him being the Redeemer. Then they remembered that God was their rock, that the Most High God, He was their Redeemer. For their Redeemer is mighty, in Proverbs chapter 23 and 11. He will plead their cause against you. Isaiah 49, 26, All flesh shall know that I am the Lord, thy Savior, and thy Redeemer. I am the Mighty One of Jacob.
Not only is he our creator and our redeemer, but lastly, he is our sustainer. In Hebrews 1, verse 3, we read, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty. Who is this that has done these things? Who is the being that is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person? Who is the one that upholds all things by the word of his power? Who is the one that has purged us of our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high? If you read Hebrews, we know that there is none other than Christ. So that essentially, Christ is establishing himself as being the one who created us. That is what we read in Genesis chapter 1. If you turn to verse 26, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Genesis 1 and verse 26. There, Genesis 1 and 26, we see. And so God said, let us do what? Make man in our image. After our likeness. So it says, and God said, let us make man. Not in my image. Not in my likeness. Nor does it say, let me make man. Nor I shall make man. But a pronoun, let us make now, plural, let us make man after our image, after our likeness. Moses in Genesis is introducing us to a, a triune God, not three gods. You know, some people say Christians, that there are three gods uh, that, that Christians serve. But no, Christians don't serve three gods. We're not polytheists, poly meaning multiple or many. We're monotheists. Mono is one. One God. The Bible says that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Exodus says that thou shalt have no other gods before me. I am the one true God. So that God then, a triune God, one God manifests are three different personalities that we see of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that second person, the second member of the Godhead we see speaking forth in Genesis, it says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Well, who is this then that speaks and that brings these things up? Well, in Hebrews chapter 1, we read that he was, he was the being of his glory, the express image of his person, the one that upholds all the world by his power. He has purged us by his blood. And he has sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Who is that? Well, that is no other person than Christ the Lord. So this person that we see speaking in Genesis that is saying, let us do this, is no other being than Christ. How do we further know? In Colossians 1 and verse 27. Sorry, verse 17, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17. We see again reference to his eternal power and his majesty in Godhead. Colossians 1 and verse 17. In fact, I'll read verse 13 first. It says that he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, again, referring to Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Who is this? 
the Christ. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, both visible and invisible. So the person that has made these things, and again, Paul is specifically stating that that person is Christ, the anointed one. He has made these things. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth. So again, we can have no question. It is clearly stated then that the one who made the things in heaven and in earth is Christ. Those things that we see that are visible and invisible. So the visible things that we see, Christ made them. Those invisible things that we do not see, Christ made them. We don't see the atoms and the molecules and the wind. We don't see the hydrogen. But God made these things, meaning Christ. Whether they be thrones or whether they be dominions or principalities or powers, essentially it is saying that the one who made them all is Christ. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things exist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And so, Christ is the one who has made all things. But he's also the one who sustains all things. Paul said that in Hebrews, that he upholds all things by the word of his power. Paul says the same thing in Colossians, that he is the one that because of him all things were created and all things exist. In Psalms 55, verse 22, the psalmist declares, Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you, and he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. God is the one who sustains and who keeps man. The reality is, is that most men don't know and understand this. Paul wrote that we live and, and that we move and that we have our being in him, but yet we are unaware. We live on this earth trying to figure it out. We spend our days and our nights wondering, trying to fathom the great mysteries of life, trying to make sense of it all, wondering if there is a God, wondering if there is a heaven, wondering if there is a hell, wondering is there an afterlife, wondering why is this problem happening, trying to figure it out, trying to make sense of those things. And he says, I am the one who has created you. I am he, I am your redeemer. I'm the one who sustains you. I'm the one who gives you breath. I'm the one who gives you life. I uphold you by the power of my word, I uphold you in the palms of my hand. Cast your burden, therefore, then upon me, because I am the one that sustains you. Psalms 18, 35, Thou hast also given me the shield of your salvation. In your right hand, it has upheld me. It upholds me. And your gentleness has made me great. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. Psalms 50, uh, 54 and verse 4. So, beloved, looking at those texts, we can see again multiple things. Number one, God is our creator. Number two, God is our redeemer. Number three, God is our sustainer. When he sets himself apart from all the heathen deities, he, he bespeaks to himself as being the creator. As though to say, bring all the other gods that you desire and want and, and ask of them, what had they formed? What had they made? 
And the irony of it is, is they have not formed or made anything. In fact, they themselves have been formed by you. That was the irony of what Jeremiah was saying, that a person goes out to the field, they find the tree that is high and mighty. They look at it, they chop it down. To some of it they use to bake. To some of it they use to build a house. To some of it they take and form an idol. To the rest of it they throw into a fireplace to burn. And yet they bow down to this thing that they have made, that they have formed, that they have fashioned. And they look to this for sustenance to sustain them. They look to this to be able to redeem them. They look to this to be able to care for them. And he's saying, but this is just the figment of your imagination. What made this piece different from the one that was burned? What made this piece of wood more sacred than the one that you use to cook your meal with? It was just happenstance, just the luck of the draw. But I, I am different from these things. You cry aloud to them, but they do not communicate and talk to you. But I'm able to talk to you. I'm able to guide you. You cry and you shed tears, but these are unable to see your tears. Yet I'm the one who bottles your tears in a bottle. You look to them for deliverance, but they do not hear. They do not see. They do not care. But I am the one who is touched with the feelings of your infirmities. Yea, in all points, tried and tested, even as you are, and yet without sin. So he is separate from every other deity, based on those things individually uh, and yet mutually. We read in the New Testament, though, as well as in the Old Testament, but more focus is given to the New Testament that a warning would come of a person who would come along and who would play God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 3 and 4, the same apostle Paul writes, and he says, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, speaking of the coming of Christ, the coming of the second coming, that it will not come except there come a falling away first. And again, that word there that you read in the Greek, it means apostasy and apostasy. There'll be a, a mighty separating from the truth. And then that man of sin is going to be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth himself above all that is called God. So the son of perdition, he's setting himself in opposition to everything that is called God. He opposes the things that are God, and he exalts himself above God. Or him that is worshipped as God. He even will sit himself in the temple of God, masquerading and showing himself that he's God. Now, doesn't that sound similar to what we read about Lucifer in Isaiah and in Ezekiel? It's, it's very similar, the exact same pattern, the, the same thought, the same process that goes on. From what we saw about Lucifer, the same thing that we see now being introduced about this man of sin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, you might identify and know, well, who is this man of sin that we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Now, keep in mind that it is not the first time or the last time that we see the man of sin or the Antichrist being introduced. It uses different terms. Some places he's called the man of sin. Others he's called the man of lawlessness. Some places you see him as the Antichrist. But it's all talking about the same person, the same being. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, John says in John chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, he says that, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. And by that trying, he means to, to test them out. He says, whether they are of God or whether they are not, because there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world, and hereby 
Know ye the Spirit of Christ, for every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, which ye have heard was coming, now already in the world. That spirit of Antichrist, you heard that he was coming, but he's already now in the world. This is what Paul is saying in 1 John chapter 4. I, I call this to your attention because when we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you remember again just what we looked at prior, it said that the day of the Lord will not come except there come a falling away first. Again, who was he talking about? He was talking about this Antichrist power. Now John says that the spirit of Antichrist was already alive in his day. So how do we explain that? Well, two things. One, he's talking about a particular system that's going to come after, after there is a falling away. But he, is, he, meaning John, is writing, saying that that same spirit that Antichrist has, it's already in the world. As a matter of fact, if you go over to 2 John chapter 1 and verse 7, you will see more of that same spirit in 2 John chapter 1 and verse 7. He says that this, there are many deceivers that have gone out into the world that do not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and what? And an antichrist or antichrist. So we're looking again that one of the trademarks in here he's saying is that look by their doctrinal per persuasion. They don't believe that Christ is come in the flesh until you can see it now. He's not talking about the Antichrist as we would look in Revelation or at the end of the world, but he's talking about the spirit, the mindset of Antichrist. Daniel chapter 7, of course, we read of the Antichrist, so what he would do. Uh, great things against the Most High. Matthew chapter 24 talks about the Antichrist. He would show signs and wonders. If it were possible, he would also deceive the very elect. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we've already read there about Antichrist and the work that he would seek to do. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse uh, 18, we read, Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have seen or heard that Antichrist is coming, even now there are many what? Antichrists have come. No, no, again, no confusion there. So don't be confused by what he's saying because it looks like he's saying Antichrist is coming. And then another place it looks like he's saying Antichrist is here. So, which one is it? He is not confused in what he is saying. What he is establishing is, is that the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well. The whole system that we see, and that spirit is going to set up the system. It's like he's doing the pre-work, and that's what Second Thessalonians chapter 2 identifies, that he is setting up. He's making the way for the true Antichrist to come. This system, and this system will not be one person, but it will be a system that will endure for hundreds of years. Further, it says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, it says that, again, that this uh, is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that, that, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. Now written, not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. For who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is the who? The Antichrist. Who denies the Father and the Son? All right. This is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and he denies the Son. Why? Because he wants to set himself up as being God. In fact, that term anti, which we use the Antichrist, 
we usually think of it meaning against Christ. But it, it also means in place of. So it is not to be necessarily against him. While that is true, but it also is in place of like a substitution. And both of those we see uh, happening there, that he sets himself against Christ by teaching things contrary to Christ, by denying Christ in the flesh, by denying the teachings of Christ, but he also puts himself in place of Christ. Well, how do we see that manifest in uh, happening as such? So we see the work of the Antichrist. We see him seeking to come. And who is this Antichrist? We talk about some of the things that are there um, and how he thus appears. Well, when you think of Antichrist, one of the principles, uh, the traits is the Antichrist seeks to control. So I know again you think about a system, um, but to our initial question of the person who played God, this Antichrist seeks to do that. But but I would take it maybe a step further and say that there have been times in which we would identify and say hey, we've done the same thing. The spirit of Antichrist seeks to control in the aspect of religious practices. That if you don't do it this way, then you will meet this consequence. Now there is a responsibility that we have certainly to be able to seek to share. In John chapter 14 and the whole New Testament speaks in of believers seeking to be disciples, to call men. But while we are called upon to call men, there's also a, a def defining line that is also clear that you also are to give men the freedom and the ability to be able to choose. But that freedom and that ability also means the freedom as well not to choose. Sometimes we see it as, okay, I'm going to give you the, you have a choice, and the choice is you better choose. If you don't choose, it's going to be the, the outcome, and it's going to be a bad outcome. But what true freedom is really is that you have the freedom to choose and not to choose. Antichrist seeks to be able to control, and so we want to control every aspect. And now uh, the mindset of Antichrist, though, the system is that it feels that it is in the place of God and that it knows what is rest. It knows what is right. I, I recall a number of times going out with family members, and I would say, hey, we're going to go out, and we'll eat. And if you choose to eat as I eat, then I'll pay for it. That doesn't mean you have to buy the exact, like, item I buy, but it means you have to eat, quote, unquote, like, of, of make vegan choices. So if you got your veggie burger with no cheese, and, oh, well, I guess that means you're going to want to pay for that then. <laughs> now, if you ordered uh, a cake, well, I, I guess that means you want to pay for that then. Because on my dime, it's going to be these things. Antichrist seeks to control. John 16, 8 says that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come and he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. I thought that was my job. You know, that, that he needs some help. <laughs> so I'll, I'll help out uh, in, in, in to do that. Sometimes you may feel, I'll, I'll help out and I'll point this out this and let this person know this and so forth. And, and people, uh, people typically know what they should do and what they shouldn't do. You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Bible says that all of us are sinners and we've all gone astray, every man after his own way. Everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. People usually know what is right and what is wrong. 
There, there is, there's some baseline that is there that everybody has. You don't believe it? Why do people look over their shoulders when they're about to steal something? Now, I know some people are brazen and so forth. But even in their brazenness of thievery or whatever it happens to do, why do they run if they feel that they're going to be accosted? If it's like, okay, this is what I'm doing is, is, is normal. People may flaunt and may be brave, but there's, according to Genesis chapter 3, within every person God places the ability to be able to know what is right and what is wrong. Now, sometimes those, they can get a little uh, out of balance, though. Okay? It can, it can it get out of balance, but every person has a conscience. And that is to be able to know what is right and to be able to know what is wrong. You can reflect and realize that you would say, well, there are some things I was doing before I heard the gospel, but I began to feel that this was not right. Nobody set you down and told you this, this, and the other. But Antichrist, the spirit is that he seeks, or the spirit of Antichrist, it seeks to control. And Antichrist will sometimes use um, fear or shame or guilt to control and to influence others. So maybe a different way of being able to go out to, to eat with said loved ones is, Let's go out to eat. I want to treat you to have to a meal. Because what I was saying uh, indirectly <laughs> was essentially if you eat like I eat, then you'll be in good shape. Okay, not, not physically in good shape, but all right. I can sign off on that because I'm seeking to follow the way uh, of God and so forth. And so maybe your choices are not aligning to that. And it may come from, quote unquote, a good place, but the reality is it is still nonetheless seeking to control one's behavior. When God never seeks to control one's behavior, rather, he seeks to let a person choose, and that by choosing him, they might choose the best. You say, well, what about, he says, well, I set before you life and death this day. He's just simply saying that I'm giving you the choice. If you choose me, there are going to be countless blessings that are there. Now, you can choose otherwise, and I'm not, quote, opposed against you, but you're going to go down the road that is going to be filled with a lot of problems. Number two, Antichrist has all of the answers. By all of the answers, it means, of course, that he knows, the system feels, um, that it is the arbiter of all things. And when we set ourselves up uh, to know all the answers, we think that we know it all and have it all. James says that if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who give it to all men liberally and upbraid if not. Proverbs chapter 3 says that Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. But sometimes when we are in that capacity that we want to play God, we act like we have all the answers and that we know. We know exactly what this person should do and what they should not do, and we get offended when they don't follow what we tell them to do. We're mad that they didn't follow our point of view. Because after all, our point of view is the right point of view. Our opinion is how God would view matters. In the early 2000s, there, the, there were bracelets and so forth that were sold, and they had WWJD on it. You remember those? Uh, what would Jesus do? And, and, and I'm not knocking the, the sentiment of what people were trying to say. But you don't know what Jesus would do in every situation. Okay? No, nobody does. I mean, if you do, set me straight. We don't know what he would do in every situation. 
Say, oh, yes, we do. We have the Bible. The Bible tells us exactly what he would do in this situation. Well, if you believe that, let's, let's talk afterwards. I want to give you a few and see what you think. Because what you may find is that there are some things that Jesus would do that would surprise you. And there's some things that he wouldn't do that would surprise you as well. But we think sometimes that we know exactly. The scriptures say that he opened up his hands, he satisfied the desire of all his living creatures that are upon the earth. Uh, Antichrist feels that he has all the answers to life's problems, but sometimes also Antichrist feels that he is the arbiter. Sometimes we feel that we, we are the ones to have to answer people's prayers. But that is God's prerogative. We are but men. Number three, Antichrist judges men. You see this all throughout the history of the Dark Ages. They judged men by a system that they had set up and that they had, uh, had established. Now we're quick to say, well, hold it. The Bible says that we are to be able to, to, uh, to, to, to judge uh, the fruit. And, and absolutely, we should look at character. Character is important. But there are a couple of other pieces to consider. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. And in John chapter 7 and verse 24, he said, judge righteously. So, so it doesn't say like, okay, just let anything go. Some people would say, well, you, you can't judge me. Like, like doing something that is like crazy, ignorant, that is wrong, and, and you, you speak to them, and they'll say, oh, you can't, who are you? How can you judge me? That, that's not what it's talking about. All right? Uh, there is uh, a judging of actions, and certainly there is a judging of, of motives. And when we're called upon then to weigh and to consider uh, actions, it is one thing, but to be able to try to figure out and to determine motives, that's something entirely different. And so you see in the scriptures, there are examples and so forth that are given. And even in, in life, you would have compassion upon a person for doing something. They may have done the wrong thing, but when you understand maybe what actuated them, there may be some leniency there. But we're not called upon to, to sit in the place of God. And Antichrist seeks to, to judge men. For in doing so, uh, we feel uh, that we are capable of making a full and the complete determination. When truly, Christ is the only one who is able to see and understand and to know everything. So we read in Psalms 87. He says, that I will write that this man was born here and this person was born there when I judge. That does not mean that he's saying, I'm going to give a free pass because you were over here. I won't be his heart because you were over there. It is simply saying, I will consider all of the factors and the variables that made you you. Because to us, when we sit in that seat, we just say, oh, you knew the truth, you should have done better. But that's it, you know. Did you do it? You know the truth? Okay, but no. Uh, to him, he looks at all the things that we don't look at. That doesn't make wrongs right. It does not excuse wrong behavior. But it allows him to understand the things that led into that behavior. So in his impartiality and in his fairness, he says all these things are going to bring to bear and to be able to consider. But Antichrist, on the other hand, sits and says that I will be able to judge men. And so this is how in the dark ages, the church judged the affairs of men simply based off of external responses or an obedience to it or to a lack thereof. 
You see, God says that we are to be godly, um, but never does he call us to be God. He tells us that we are to be Christ-like, but never are we told that we are to be as Christ. In Desire of Ages, page 550, we read that in matters of conscience, the soul must be left untrammeled. No one is to control another's mind or to judge for another or to prescribe his duty. You know, that, that is probably new for many of us because we think we, ha we have it figured out. You do exactly as I do, you're going to be fine. But every situation is different. Now, the answer is the same. Christ is the answer, the same for everyone. But in the various situations and dilemmas of life, people have to try to figure it out. And so we sometimes see things and we say, well, well this is what uh, I would do. And though we, we may try our best, the reality is, is we don't know what we would do in that situation until that situation happened to us. Therefore, then we must have uh, sympathy to those who go through that situation. And we must be willing to offer prayer not as a holier-than-thou mentality, but recognizing and seeking to understand the challenge or the struggle that they may be going through. But when we set ourselves in a different position, as though that we are the arbiter of what is right and what is wrong, then it is really a matter of them then seeking to come up to the standard of what we have interjected and interposed upon them But no one is to control another man's mind. To judge for another or to prescribe his duty. God gives to every soul the freedom to think and to follow his own convictions. Every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. No one has a right to merge his own individuality into that of another. In all matters where principle is involved, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. In Christ's kingdom, there is no lordly oppression, no compulsion of manner. The angels of heaven do not come to the earth to rule and to exact homage, but as messengers of mercy to cooperate with men and uplifting humanity. Uh, Father in heaven, we pray that you would help us uh, to let you be God. Uh, to not put ourselves in the position of God and to cooperate with you in the work of saving men. For we ask and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.